Okay, <clears throat> I hope everybody can hear me and uh, see. <clears throat> okay, hello everyone and uh, I hope you hear me and everything is all right and you can see the presentation. Uh, my name is Samsa Holopainen, I am a, a PhD student. <clears throat> doctoral candidate or whatever in the University of Helsinki and uh, I'm working on a dissertation about um, in Iranian loan words the Uralic languages and uh, I'm also a former activist of Mafun and uh, <clears throat> I was asked by Mafun board members to prepare a presentation for this uh, first session of this Mafun Academy and so I prepared a presentation about the introduction to Uralic languages. And I'm so, so I'm going to give a short overview about the Uralic languages and linguistics. Uh, there is actually not, there are not too many things on the slides, but I try to tell you a bit more than that. And uh, you can ask in the chat, I guess. And in the end, there should be a plenty of place for questions also. Uh, and well, I, before I start, I have to say that uh, that although although I have the basic training in Uralic linguistics, so there are of course some aspects of the Uralic studies that are less familiar for me. And since I see that there are many professional Uralic linguists also in the in the audience, uh, I hope you forgive me if I say some uh, something that. Uh, is it, well, I'm not going to say anything that's inaccurate, but if I omit some f important information, I hope that you will forgive me. And well, so on, let's start. So, introduction to Uralic languages. <clears throat> so, list of Uralic languages was the first thing I was asked to prepare. So, I uh, here in these two slides, you should see the list of all. So, we start from the western part of the Uralic family. There are the Finnic languages and the Sami languages. The Finnic forms a subgroup of relatively closely related languages which derive from Proto Finnic, which uh, the Finnic Proto language is split up maybe less than, uh, probably less than 2000 years ago. It includes Finnish, uh, which is the state language of Finland and uh, which is also spoken. spoken uh, on uh, some of the neighboring countries of Finland and some other regions also. And it includes also Meankieli and Kveen, which are uh, very closely related to Finnish, uh, but are considered their own languages these days in um, Sweden and in Norway, respectively. And Karelian is also very closely related to Finnic. It's, uh, spoken these days in Russia, I mean in the Republic of Karelia, which is part of the Russian Federation, and also in the Tver uh, Oblast of Russia, and also in Finland. Uh, I don't know the exact number of speakers, but it's uh, less than 100,000, but more than 50,000. And also the Olonet Karelian is sometimes considered a dialect of Karelia, sometimes um, separate language, it's spoken in the north of the Ladoga lake. Um, and then there is a Ludic or Ludia, I hope that I wrote the name in English correctly. Um, it's uh, sometimes also considered a dialect of Karelian, but also considered many by many linguists a uh, language of its own separate language it's also very close related to Vepsi and some uh, linguists say it's closer or many would say actually say that it's uh, closer to Vepsi than Karelian uh. and there's the Vepsian which is spoken <sighs> In, in Russia also, 
in Republic of Karelia and in the Leningrad Oblast. And it uh, can be separated to two main dialect groups. Uh, the total number of speakers is uh, some thousand. Don't remember the exact number, but less than 10,000. And then there is in the Ingria, the historical region of Ingria or Ingermanland, Ingeri, there is Isorian, which is closely related to Karelian and Finnish, and spoken by extremely few people these days, and Bosic or Boshan, which is also well it's closely related to Estonian, and it's spoken by um, also by only a handful of people, so they are like unfortunately more rebound languages, one could say. And then there is uh, 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 Est Estonian, which uh, I apologize, but it seems that I, while I included South Estonian in this list, I forgot to write the North Estonian, the Standard Estonian here. It's, uh, I'm very sorry about this embarrassing mistake, but Estonian is also a Uralic language and part of the Finnic group. And then there's South Estonian, which is a different language is spoken in Southern Estonia and also in the nearby regions and the Russian border. Uh, and uh, well, it, the language is sometimes called also Verosetu due to its two main dialects. Uh, at least uh, Tapani Salminen has used this kind of um, name for the language Verosetu. And, and then there's Livonian, which is uh, some say it has died out or it's, it has died out, but uh, there are some people who are revitalizing it and some. People used to speak it, but uh, well, uh, of officially it once died out. But well, okay. So there are the. Uh, I, I hope this is not too boring for you guys listing these languages. That's what I was asked to do. I hope there will be more. I hope there will be more uh, exciting parts of this presentation also. So there are the Sami languages which are spoken north of the Finnic languages in the northern Finland, other Scandinavia, and. Um, in uh, Kola Peninsula in Russia. Uh, historically, the Sami languages have been spoken also in southern and central Finland and Karelia. It's by uh, Finnic languages in the Middle Ages and also later. So there are 10 or 9 Sami languages uh, alive. There have been historically more. So starting from the east, Akkala Sami has, is considered it by most of the linguists, if I know correctly. Uh, and then there is Ter Sami with very few speakers, Kildin Sami with also very few speakers. They are spoken in the Murmansk region of Russia. And then there are Skolt, Inari, and Not Sami in Finland. Skolt Sami and Inari Sami are spoken by a couple of hundreds of people each. And, uh, and actually, this. Inari is called Kildin, Teer and Akkala are considered East Sami languages and the rest of them are considered West Sami languages, but I mean, this has significance only from the point of view of subgrouping Uralic languages. This uh, East Western has no political or ad administrative significance or anything like that. So then there's North Sami, which is the biggest Sami language spoken by, it's actually, and now I see that it would have been probably good to write the number of speakers here in the slides, but I didn't do it. But anyway, it's spoken by uh, many tens of thousands of people, whereas the other Western Sami languages, Sule, Pite, Ume and South Sami are spoken by much less people. South Sami is spoken by some hundreds and, uh, well, at least Pite Sami is uh, very Endangered, as of course all the Sami languages, but it varies. Some are more endangered than the others. There will be some more about this towards the end of the presentation. And then there is Mordvin languages in central parts of European Russia. They are um, divided to uh, two main dialect groups, Ersa and Moksha. And Mari, um, also in like in the central parts of European Russia, in Mari Republic and the neighboring borders and the neighboring regions uh, divided usually into Meadow and Hilmari, two main dialects or languages, but of course 
there are more dialects than there's two of them, so it can be split into more subdialects. Then there is Komi, spoken in Komi Republic and the Perm region where the variety that's spoken in the Perm region, Permski Krai has an official status as a separate language from Ipermiak. There is Udmur, which is spoken by spoken in the Republic of Udmurti and also in some neighboring regions like Bashkiria and uh, Tatarstan. And actually all of these uh, aforementioned languages have several hundreds of thousands of speakers. I mean, I guess Komi, Komi Permiak doesn't have that many, but in combined with the rest of the Komi. And the list continues. So there's Hungarian, uh, spoken in Hungary, in Hungary and in the neighboring regions, Slovakia, Romania, by in Romania, more than a million people in Slovakia, for several hundreds of thousands, and also some people in Austria, Croatia, and Serbia. They also have old traditional Hungarian minorities there. And um, in Romania, there is also this group of Chango Hungarians who are a rather small group in the Moldavian region of Romania, and the dialect is. Uh, rather divergent from the rest of the Hungarian dialects and from the standard Hungarian. So while it is not a separate language, it's, it's often separately mentioned in these kind of presentations. And there are Kanti and Mansi, the Obu Greek languages, which uh, include, uh, yeah, actually, ah, uh, oh my god, I, in the Mansi case, I mean, that's, I, I, the North Mansi is not Dead. I mean, this uh, cross-like symbol indicates dead languages, but uh, not Mansi is alive. Uh, not all of the Mansi dialects are dead, only East, South and West Mansi. Uh, uh, and the hunt, in the Hanti case, only the South Hanti is dead and East and North Hanti are still living with thousands of speakers. It's elect and uh, both Mansi and especially Hanti can be there, uh, even Inside East Hanti or North Hanti group, there is a lot of dialect uh, diversity. And then the Samoidic languages are uh, actually, I uh, at the start that I don't know whether I use the right names for the Selkup dialects here, but if I know correctly, only the North Selkup is doing well. But if, if I have inaccurately written, feel free and say. And 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 uh, and uh, I uh, omit that. Well, also, so Kamas and Matar are also dead, as many of you probably know. So, so I. Uh, it seems that I made some parts of my presentation too hastily, and that's why I didn't indicate that Kamas and Matar are also dead languages. So the rest of the Samoyed languages, Ganasan, Forest Nenets, Tundra Nenets, Forest Enets, and Tundra Enets are. The living languages, but uh, Enets is doing well among them. The, especially the Enets languages are very endangered. And all of them are endangered, but Tundra Enets has uh, 20,000 or something speakers. So it's doing relatively well. Okay, so maybe that's for the listing of Uruk languages. Um, well, actually, I didn't say where uh, Hanti, Mansi, and somebody are spoken, but they are spoken in Western Siberia, and this uh, Kamas and Mother were spoken around the Sayan Mountains, which is more south and east. Then, well, you're like as a family. Well, actually, there will be a bit more about uh, the taxonomy and classifications later, but this is a well, a solidly defined language family, so there is no question about that. I mean, it's a Scientific fact that Uralic languages form a family, and it can be said that it's one of the most well researched language families, maybe after Indo European or along with Indo European, and along with some other language families, of course. In the book of um, by Lyle Campbell, Historical Linguistics, uh, which is actually not included in the bibliography of this presentation because I forgot to put it there, there is a list of language families, and it's uh, indicated that. Uh, how thoroughly they are researched, and the Uralic is the research of Uralic languages is called highly advanced by Campbell in that book, which is well, it's already from the 90s, but the this um, 
statement is still true. And uh, well, uh, some historical facts, many linguists think that the Urheimat, which the original speaking area of the Uralic language was somewhere in central Russia, rather on the European side of the Uralic mountains, some say it was east from that, so there's actually not such a consensus, because some leading Uralists say it's, um, I mean, well, many leading Uralists say that it was in the European side, but some leading researchers of Ural languages say that it was the original speaking area was on the eastern side of the Ural Mountains, western Siberia. And well, uh, usually the Proto-Uralic language was dated a bit earlier than I wrote here, but uh, Petr Kallio, who's a very, in his 2006 article, Suomen Kantakeet and Absolutusta Chronologia, thought that um, the Proto-Uralic should be dated only roughly 2000 years before Christ, because of, uh, mainly because of evidence that can be deciphered from different Indo-European loan words over the layers because the Indo-European languages can be more badly dated because of uh, old written sources, for instance. So, so, so that's why the Indo-European loan words are very helpful in dating and also locating the Uralic language, the early phases of Uralic languages, and actually the location, the rather western location in the European side of Russia. Uh, it's also partly based on the evidence that there clearly were contacts between Proto-Indo-Iranian and, and Proto-Uralic, and maybe even before that between Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Uralic. There will be more about loanwords soon. Um, so maybe that's about that for now. You can ask about that. Uh, yes, general overview of grammatical features. I have to say that uh, as a researcher of etymology and historical phonology, I am, uh, I, I, of course, know the basic things of, Euro of the grammar of Uralic languages, but uh, for some this might seem amateurish because I'm not a really specialist of, uh, of grammar. And, uh, well, one can say that uh, Uralic languages are most of them agglutinative languages, typologically, and the Proto-Uralic certainly was was language like this, so so there is not, um, so in the Proto-Uralic there wasn't this kind of inflection that the stem, the varying stems, but uh, like in Indo-European or Semitic, but the words were, like cases were formed through suffixation, that there are suffixes for different cases cases and uh, positive suffixes and so on, and many Uralic languages these days also retain the same uh, kind of linguistic structure, and the word order was probably SOV, that means subject, object, verb, as it is in many Uralic languages, also these days. I mean, uh, I'm not a specialist in word order, but I'm in Finnic and in Sami languages, it's um, has been reversed probably because of, or possibly because of context of, with Germanic and Baltic languages. So in Finnish, the, when, in the Finnic languages, the word order is SVO, like uh, like in English. So you say that I, mina, what that I eat fish, it's a uh, minas and kala, and in Sami it would be the same, like um, Kuoli, or something like this, but but actually in South Sami they they have the SOV. It's either a retention or or it has been uh, or it's um, in the, it's well it's probably a retention I guess I would say, but it also can be that the older Sami languages there was once SVO and then the South Sami has innovated in a way that makes it look like it has retained the old um, word order, but because it's uh, South Sami is. So otherwise, uh, conservative, it's uh, not a bad idea to think that they had to have retained SOB. 
And well, of course, in some languages like Hungarian, it's dif difficult to say because the word order depends on many things, but I'm not going to speak more about that if you don't mind, because as I said, I'm not really a specialist of these things, so I don't want to say anything inaccurate. And well, this is also something which might be very obvious for some of you that the ironic languages tend to use postpositions and not prepositions. I mean, in modern Finnish, you have both, but uh, most direct languages, you have only postpositions. And while some languages have become more reflective than, than proto uralic for instance, like Estonian and Sami languages, most of them, so that instead of simply using suffixes, you also have uh, uh, stem alternations and uh, Let's say both in Estonian and in Sami, you have uh, forms where you don't actually use the case form at all, but uh, or the case suffix at all, but the grammatical meaning is expressed solely by a lexion. And well, that's something which uh, it's probably interesting to mention that there is this objective conjugation in some of the Uralic languages. So not only the subject is uh, of the sentence is conjugated, no, the verb is not con the verb is conjugated not only of, um, how do you say it, according to the subset of the sentence, but also, also according to the object of the sentence. So in Hungarian you have this, and in Hanti and Mansi, and in some other languages, and in Baudvin, but many details of the objective conjugation differ. So there are well, the big differences between these and, and in Maudvin, the, they have also a system that is kind of similar, but nevertheless a bit different. I mean, uh, it's maybe better to explain it at another time, but uh, it sort of sort of resembles the Hungarian one, but it's uh, more or some aspect of the Hungarian one, but it's actually quite quite different. So, so there is this so-called objective conjugation in some of the Uralic languages, but uh, the systems are actually quite different. And this is also something that is not sort of special to the Uralic languages. I don't actually know anything that is... Uh, I mean, all of these things are can be found also in some other language families. And actually some thing that I maybe which was actually hinted at in this uh, section about Sami and Estonia. There is this uh, consonantal gradation, which is a very interesting phenomenon for many linguists. I mean, it's found in most of the Finnic languages, most of the Sami languages, and in uh, Nanasan. And it's uh, well, there have and it uh, means that in, in the uh, the certain consonants. If it actually the, the stops, kate, p, they alternate, uh, short and long stops alternate, and also they alternate with spirants. Well, historically, spirants due to syllable structure is a very uh, sort of, I don't know, dummy explanation for that, but that's the basic, and uh, it's a a system that the Insami and Nanasan is sort of the same thing, but the rules are different. And and actually, in in today's some North Sami, for instance, or Estonian, it's actually you can't see these syllable things there anymore. It's a, it has become synchronically uh, quite uh, opaque. So. In Finnish, it's more more uh, transparent, but the system is more transparent. But it's uh, probable that this uh, this uh, consonantal gradation is a different innovation, even in Finnic and in Sami. So it's not uh, probably well, probably it is not uh, inherited from some earlier proto language of Finnic and Sami, and uh, and um, in Nanasan it's also separate innovation. I mean, it's not inherited from Proto-Uralic. There are some linguists who think so. I mean, uh, Yevgeny Helimsky, who has already passed, unfortunately, 
used it in so and some others as well, but at least most of the Finnish linguists working with the Ukrainian languages tend not to think like this. And um, so, yes, well, then let's go format the forward. It's, uh, I was also asked to present something about contacts with other language families. So the contacts within the European languages are most important in that way that they were the sort of the earliest contacts. Um, Sorry. There was a later contact with other language families, notably with the Turkic languages. I don't know that much about them, but uh, there are good sources about. The also, in some of the references, which I will give you in the end, you will find some stuff working with that is dealing with these Turkic contacts also, but uh, I will not speak about them because I don't know them very well. And uh, in any case, they were not this early as the contacts with. Uh, in the European, so possibly there were already contacts between Proto in the European and Proto Uralic, but uh, since uh, Proto Uralic was spoken later than Proto in the European, according to Petri Kallio at least, and his view is followed by many other linguists, at least in Finland. Uh, so there probably were in the European words in Proto Uralic already, but it's uh, not certain that they were acquired from proto in the European, maybe from some some a bit later because they well this is complicated too because in proto in the European you have uh, it split up around uh, 4000 BC, but after that when the proto in the European split up it's split up to the Anatole. Uh, well this is maybe difficult to understand for those who don't know in the European languages very well, but the when proto indo europeans split up, only first only Anatolian group split up, then the Tocharian probably, and after that the sort of um, core Indo-European that remained after these uh, split ups, it still uh, was uh, rather close to proto indo european So if, if the proto uralic or proto finno ugric had some long words from, let's say, core Indo-European, it they would. Uh, look pretty much the same as the, in the European no words. I don't know whether it was uh, understandable like this, but 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 after that there certainly were proto in the Iranian loan words in a proto finno ugric or proto uralic uh, in a, after a couple of slides there will be more about the proto languages the, the proto uralic but anyway in the already in early Basis of the Uralic languages, they had contacts with Indo Iranian languages, and uh, after that, also uh, separate the Uralic languages had separate contacts with uh, Iranian languages, like the Permic languages, Mordvin, Mari had. Uh, uh, well, Inuit, no, uh, well, at least I don't know about those. So, actually, there, there, is, there is this. Um, there is this. Uh, some linguists, notably Knut Bergsland, who was a very good Norwegian linguist, uh, Finno, he was the professor of Finno Ugric languages in the University of Oslo. And he, besides his work with Finno Ugric languages, especially with Sami, which is very significant, he also worked with, uh, he also worked with uh, uh, Inuit languages and Aleut languages. And uh, he actually had this. Uh, Article. I don't remember the year when it was published, but I guess it was published in the Journal de la Société Finno-Ukrainienne, Suomalaisuuklaisuusraanaikakauskirja, where he compared the Uralic and Eskimo-Aleutic languages. And uh, because I mean, there there be some linguists who have tried to come up with a hypothesis that um, would connect Uralic and Inuitic as a one very large language family, but it hasn't gained a very wide acceptance and. Uh, and the Bergsland, in his article, he sort of uh, reviewed this hypothesis and he sort of said that it's, while it's not impossible, it's possible to prove it. So, so actually, I don't know about any, and I think there, uh, nobody has been able to convincingly show that there would have been like loan words from Inuit to Uralic or vice versa, but. Uh, there has been this hypothesis about Inuit and Uralic 
belonging to the same language family, but as I said, it's not universally accepted. So, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Um, and um, and actually, well, the proto uralic probably was spoken not in the neighborhood of the proto Inuit or Eskimo or uh, Inuit. Well, the Eskimo Aleut, or how do you name the macro family which includes Inuit and Aleut? I mean, they also spoken probably in the Eurasian side and were spread lately. I mean, Inuit. So they probably, as we know, that there are also Inuit languages in the extreme east of the Siberia, so probably they spread from there to America and Greenland and not vice versa, but probably they still were not spoken very near to proto uralic So to answer the question, uh, I don't know any, I haven't heard of any contacts with uh, between or any conclusive any evidence for contacts between Inuit and uh, uralic languages. And about Caucasian languages, well, um, Bernard Munkachi had this book about uh, in in the beginning of the 20th century, which was called uh, Bernard Munkachi was a very good Hungarian linguist, an early finno ugricist but uh, and he had this book Arya Esh Kaukasusi Alamaga Finno Modern which can be which, which can be uh, translated roughly uh, as uh, in the Iranian and Caucasian elements in the finno ugric languages, and in that book he presented some Caucasian etymologies or words, but they haven't gained much support after that. And these days, uh, at least that comes to my knowledge, uh, people are not. I mean, uh, scholars, linguists of Finnish scholars of Uralic languages are not considering that there would have been early contact between Caucasian and um, Caucasian languages and uh, the Uralic languages. Actually, in in the between Indo-European languages and Caucasian languages, there probably were some contacts. At least there are some Indo-Europeans who believe so. I, um, well, I can't come up with any uh, exact references uh, re references now. Uh, there, yes, uh, there will be more about this Altaic uh, uh, soon. So. Um, well, yes, but but anyway, so I don't know of any Caucasian loan words in Uralic or vice versa. In Indo-European, there might be some, which is interesting, probably because the Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European was spoken somewhere between a Uralic and Caucasian languages, which is logical if it was spoken in the steppe regions of Russia or Ukraine. And then, uh, well, this is... Uh, um, not so important from the point of view of Proto-Uralic, but from the point of view of Uralic languages in general, it is good to know that uh, Sami and Finnic have had very early contacts with Germanic languages also, which shows that the, both the predecessors of Germanic and those of uh, Sami and Finnic have been spoken around Baltic Sea for quite a, some time. And uh, And and so so there are old Germanic loan words, and also in Finnic there are also very old Baltic loan words. And there are some Baltic loans also in in Sami, but according to a recent study by Ante Aikio, uh, those were acquired first to Finnic and from Finnic to Sami, so there probably was not were not direct contest between Proto Baltic and Proto. Sami. And what they are uh, northwest in the European, which I wrote here, means that there are also some archaic loanwords in Sami and Finnic, which uh, were possibly acquired from uh, uh, not from Proto Indo European, but from uh, an archaic total language of Proto Indo European, which is called Northwest Indo European by some researchers. It means that um, it's sort of a possible, possibly a predecessor to. Baltic and Germanic and Baltic, Slavic and Germanic, but it still was phonologically very close to the Proto-Indo-European or Core Indo-European. And then there were also, well, there are, as everyone knows, there are, I mean, there are Slavic loanwords in every 
in, a, in every Uralic language. In some of them, they are actually quite late from Russian, but there are some big languages in Finnic, at least according to some researchers, but this is a debated issue. And because I haven't done any personal research on that, it's maybe better if I don't say more about that, but it's good to keep that in mind. Um, well, uh, and then um, before commenting on this uh, Yenisei and Altaik, uh, uh, I will show that uh, just a moment. Well, some early loans, these are part of those loans that have been considered uh, in the European, Proto European loans in Proto Uralic. Uh, they can be found in many. In many uh, works of Jorma Koivolehto, for instance, you will have references on them in the end. And there are in the Uranian loan words, this is my favorite part. And actually, if you're more interested in this topic, uh, I recommend you to read my recent poster on this topic. I hope you can see the link. I don't know if it's working, but you can. Uh, voila. But, but I mean, I don't know whether you can actually click on the link of this presentation, but I hope you can see the letters and then you can type it on your browser if you're interested. So, so it's just uh, there are these, uh, so in the proto Uralic or at least the proto finno ugric there were Indo-Iranian loan words, for instance, this word meaning hundred, with, for instance, in Finnish is Sata and Hungarian Sars, Isami, Chuosti and um, so on. Uh, it's a loan word from uh, uh, proto Iranian, word meaning 100, reconstructed something like shata to proto Iranian, would be shata in Sanskrit, in the classical language of India, and in Satan or something like that in Avestan. Oh, well, yes, thanks. It's great that you will send the presentation. Just comment about that. And, and then, well, there are actually, is, uh, I didn't put very many examples here because I didn't want to spend too much time on here and because you can see more from the presentation, which doesn't have, of course, not all examples, but some more than this. And there are some later, so this is from Proto Indo Iranian, and Proto Iranian, which is a daughter language of Proto Indo Iranian. There, it also did provide loan words to Uralic languages. So in Finnic and Modvin, Mari, Permic, there are some words which were maybe acquired to, um, well, not Proto Finno Ugri, probably, but some later Proto language, Proto Finno Permic or Western Uralic or something. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this is one of these Finnic word for Hufta. It's uh, probably an Iranian, I mean, proto Iranian, a long word from proto Iranian. It's one of Jorma Koivolehto's Iranian etymologies. In proto Iranian, you have this uh, participle, Tsuhto, which means, no, it's Tsuhta. I misspelled it. I maybe can con correct these misspelled things after, after, before this is being, to send, being sent to people because this is an embarrassing mistake. So it should be Tsuhta. And the Finnic Hufta very semantically very well fits the Iranian word, but more than Tsuhta, which means three, it's obviously related to the Finnic word, but the meaning has innovated. And, um, and actually, they are not completely regular cognates, so it's even possible that Finnic and Mordvinian borrow this word separately. Uh, actually, I, I mean, I could speak for hours about these Indo Iranian loan words, but because I had to speak about other things, I'm not going to do so. But it's good to know that there are early Proto Indo, -Proto -Indo Iranian loan words in Proto Finno Ugric, and then there are later loan words from Iranian in different Uralic languages. And actually, uh, I, because I'm working on a dissertation about this topic, I wanted to put here something of my own. So this etymology, this Mari 
Muro and Mor be Moro. Words meaning song. There are also um, verbs meaning to sing, which are uh, etymologically connected with these words. They um, maybe are also loan words from proto, uh, proto in Iranian or proto Iranian root mrauch, which uh, means speak or to recitate or something like that. Uh, the semantic. Uh, Match is not perfect, but it's, uh, I would say, it's uh, good enough. So this is an etymology of my own. Uh, it uh, has been presented on some presentations and at least one abstract, which is found in the net, but it hasn't been published in any article, so I kindly ask you not to plagiate it. I mean, I mean, I trust that none of you would be plagiating it, I just wanted to say, and uh, you can criticize it if you want, if you don't believe it, but please don't plagiate. Of course, if you want to cite it, you can cite this presentation, or you can ask me, so I can give you something else to cite. So, just say because it hasn't been officially published, so I was just asking you not to steal it. Sorry for asking this. And uh, well, yes, and there is the link if you want to see more. Uh, so maybe, um, well, yes. So uh, uh, about the taxonomy of Uralic. There are various views, and now I actually regret that I didn't include any illustrative uh, pictures of family trees here. But uh, so, um, as I said earlier, the Uralic languages, it's a solidly defined language family. Uh, so there is no question about sorry, what languages belong to this family. And we know a lot about the taxonomy, but maybe not all. So in this, uh, I showed you the list of Uralic languages earlier, and this is sort of the basic list of these uh, low-level subgroups. So we have Finnic languages, we have Sami, we have Mordvin, Mari, Permic, and these are sort of split up to smaller languages. And well, we have Hung... Uh, Sorry, uh, okay. Hungarian, Hanti, Mansi, which are usually grouped together as Ugric, and we have Samoyedic. So these are sort of the uncon uncontroversial, uh, uncontroversial low level uh, subgrouping. So these are very valid subgroups that are bigger subgroups. Uh, this is actually a bit. Well, if, if you don't understand what I'm saying, please ask, I mean, uh, because this is a bit hard to explain, but uh, traditionally it was thought that the proto uralic split into two languages, into Samoyedic and into finno ugric But um, according to some researchers, uh, like Tapani Salminen or Kaisa Häkkinen, the, uh, this didn't necessarily, it didn't necessarily split up into two languages, but it has split into into more branches immediately. So, because historically there have been many low-level branches in a way that um, that uh, Finnic and Sami have been grouped together, and then they have been grouped together with Morvin and Mari in a finno volgaic derived, and it has been a custom derived from finno volgaic proto language, which would have been derived from finno permic proto languages, includes also the permic languages, but uh, there are not very, there's not very much support for these intermediary proto languages. Uh, it's, um, I mean, for some there is some support, but for some there is not that much. And well, I could I can recommend you these books by Kazakin and Tapani Salmin, and you, in the end, you will see more um, detailed references to them. And uh, actually, there are also in recent years there have been um, other alternative views on the taxonomy. So Daniel Abondolo in his um, in his um, handbook, The Iran Languages, he proposes an alternate model and uh, also has which is with well quite conceivably quite conceivably presented 
another kind of model for the grouping of Uralic languages. But, uh, but so, so I would say that the, we know what languages belong to Uralic language family. We can very exactly group them into these smaller subgroups that we know what languages belong to Finnic, what languages belong to Permic, and so on. So if I show the first slide, uh, I mean this kind of thing. But um, uh, yes, but 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 about the bigger subgroups like Finno Volga, Finno Permic, and so on, uh, they are more questionable. And uh, well, I'm not going to speak more about that now because it could take the whole evening. And there are also, I would just like to say that uh, it's the traditional view to group Hungarian and Huntian Mans together as the Ugric subgroup, and to within that to group Hunti and Mansi together as the Obi-Ugric subgroup. But uh, some researchers don't agree with that. But well, actually, it's a too complicated issue to be addressed in this very general presentation. So I'm just going to say that there are varying views on that. And in the article by Tapani Salmin, in which you will find the references, you will find more about that. So this is some basic things about the structure of the language family. Uh, if some of you disagree, you are free to say so. I mean, because I know that there are many professional Uralic linguists in the audience and uh, different, different, uh, different researchers might have different opinions on this. And then about Uralic and Altaic, I am not a specialist of Altaic languages. Uh, so maybe some of you know more about them, but I know that uh, historically there have been linguists who have linked the Uralic and Altaic as being part of the same family. But that's these days, this is that is not widely accepted. So there are typological similarities. I spoke, told you some things, some basic things about the structure of the Uralic languages and the the, the Altaic languages, uh, Mongolian, Turkic. Tungusic are typologically very similar to Uralic languages, but probably they are much related to Uralic. So there have been later Ur language contact between Turkic and Uralic languages. There are many only, there are some very early Turkic loans in Samoidic languages. Uh, Andra Shonatas has a very good article on that. There are very many Turkic loans in Hungarian from different periods, and there are Long words from Tatar in. Um, well, I would say that, well, okay, there are long words from many Turkic languages from Chubash and from Tatar in, in Mari, Morvin, and Permic languages, and also some Tatar long words in Si, and some in Hanti, I guess, uh, if I remember correctly. And um, so they have been contact between these two, but uh, they are not part of the same language family. And many al uh, linguists, not all, but many, linguists who work with Altaic languages even question the validity of the Altaic family as a real language family. So it's Turkic, Tungusic and Mongolic, and maybe some other like Korean and Japanic. They have, they have been historically in a very close contact and that's why they share many common words. They have very many uh, there is much common in the grammatical structure, but it's probable that they don't derive from a common source, but they form a so-called Sprachbund. It's sort of a standard Kieliliitto in Finnish. In English, you often use the Sprachbund term for this. And, uh, and, and uh, well, that's maybe something I, maybe most I can say. On Altaic, uh, this, there is a good article by Stefan Georg, but I forgot to put the, um, the year here, but I will, if you allow me, I will, before sending this presentation to you, I will put a more, a more precise reference to Stefan Georg's paper on here. It's called On Poverty, on the Poverty of Altaicism, and it's a very good article about the Altaic languages and their relations to each other. And in the end, I wanted to say that although, so in the beginning of Uralic linguistics, for instance, Matthias Alexander Kastreen, who was the great Finnish linguist who 
was sort of one of the founders of Neuralink studies. Well, he was also one of the founders of Altaic studies, and uh, he did research on many Altaic languages as well. And he considered this to be related, Neuralink and Altaic. And although we these days don't, because still we don't consider them to be related anymore, there are many some scientific societies which, uh, because of these historical reasons, reasons of research history, they do they. Uh, support the research of both language families. So, Suomalais Ukrainen Seura, which is known as Societe Finno Ukrainen internationally, also known as Finno Ukrainen Society, but they usually use the French name because it's cooler and has more tradition in it. Uh, they uh, publish books on both Uralic and Altaic languages. They um, a presentation which also teams connected to Altaic languages are presented. So there is this research tradition that there are scholars who are working on both of these languages and it's a beautiful tradition, although they, the language families themselves are not related. And also in, in Germany there is a uh, uh, Societas or Societas Uralo Altaika. They have a series called Studia Uralo Altaika, but that's not what I wanted to write here. Uh, I apologize for my uh, repeated uh, small errors in the script of my presentation. Uh, sorry about that. I hope this uh, is not too clumsy to follow. And well, okay, and somebody asked about Yeniseyan. I don't know much about Yeniseyan languages. Actually, I, don't, I know very little about it, but uh, well, um, well, there have been some contacts between individual Samoyedic languages and the Yeniseyan languages. Uh, I don't know much about that, but um, if someone knows, they can comment. But I uh, unfortunately can't say much about that. Maybe I should have prepared something about that also. But um, but they, they are not, they, there haven't been any early proto-language level contact. There haven't been very early contacts between Yeniseyan and Uralic, but it's it's later. And, and still about Altaic, I mean, I only mentioned that there have been language contact between Uralic and Turkic. There has been also language contact between Uralic and Tungusic. There is an etymological, etymological dictionary of uh, Tungusic loans in Samoyedic, which is written by Anikin and Elimski. And, uh, and it's uh, nice to know that there are, have been contacts between Ket and Easter Hunty. Wasn't sure about that, but but I, I only recall the contest between Samoyedic and Yeniseyan, but it's good to know of Ubiugri context as well. And so, so there have been Tungusic, uh, Tungusic uh, long words in, in, in both, well, at least in Samoyedic and probably in Ubiugri as well. Also, Istvan Futak has an article about that uh, in the if I remember correctly, it's in the Uralic Languages Handbook, which is edited by Dennis, Dennis Sinner. So about Yukagir, uh, well, if I know little about Altaic, I have to know that I know even less about Yukagir. So Antaikio has uh, articles about the Uralic Yukagiric sound correspondences, and it, it was very recently published, uh, two years ago, roughly in the Finnish Ukrisa Forsungen, the number 62 of the Finnish Ukrisa Forsungen. It can be found in the internet, in Antaikios Academia Edu page. And, uh, and in that he very thoroughly reviews the possible cognates of Uralic and Yukagiric. And he comes to the conclusion that these are definitely not related. So there are some accidental similarities between the two families. And of course, there are contacts. There have been contacts between these families. So there are at least early Samoyedic loans in Yukagir. So it's interesting because Yukagir, they are spoken quite far from the Samoyedic languages these days. But probably historically or prehistorically, they have been spoken closer to where they, they have been contacts between the two families, but they are not related. Uh, I don't know, as I said, I don't know nearly anything about Yukagir, but 
I know on the IQ and I trust him that he is writing this because he's one of the best researchers of Uralic etymology these days and one of the best researchers of Uralic uh, historical linguistics in general in historical phonology especially and uh, if he says that well I mean uh, no no I'm well this is maybe not a good way to argue I mean I to not, not a good argument that something is right because someone says so I would say that I have read his article and he's in this article his argument which he usually seem very convincing and it seems that he has reviewed this very big material and uh, on the basis of that he has come to the conclusion that they are not related and he criticized some of the works by Peter Piespanen who is a who is a researcher in Stockholm University who has written a couple of articles about contacts about the possible relations of Uralic and Yugagir and uh, I here criticize his Piespanen's work quite heavily I mean I don't know much about the other work by Peter or Peter Piespanen about this guy called Piespanen in Stockholm but his articles on Yugagir Uralic sound correspondences are is the results of these articles are not valid and the ICO shows him so while I don't want to say anything bad about this Piespanen guy behind his back I have to say that if you are interested in Yugagir please consult Ante Aikio's article first and only after that read the Piespanen's articles so um, so yes so the similarities are results from context and from also from some accidental similarities which is quite common if you compare two language families you always find some words which look nice look look nice look similar but sometimes it's only due to accidental similarity well and well okay so this was more, was more about the more about the historical stuff and then i was asked to speak about social linguistic situation now uh, i again have to Revert to the argument that there are professional scholars of Uralic in the audience and also people who belong to several Uralic people speak several Uralic languages so some of you might have more in detail knowledge about the social linguistic situation but well presenting a general picture of the Uralic sociolinguistics is well difficult because there are many languages spoken in many different countries in different political situations so their social linguistic situation, well, it differs widely from region to region. And uh, so we start, there are these majority languages, Finnish, Estonian and Hungarian. So they have a perfect social linguistic situation because they are the majority languages of their own countries. Official languages, there is everything published in these languages. The newspapers, TV programs, Spider-Man comics, cookbooks, everything. So all the laws are published in these languages in those countries. So they are doing perfectly well as all the other European or like a, practically all the other European state languages, like other like Swedish or Slovakian or Portuguese or any other majority language. But of course, there are minority languages elsewhere. For instance, Hungarian is doing perfectly well in Hungary, which is obvious, but it's spoken, as I said already, already in Romania and Slovakia, in Austria, Slovenia, Serbia, Croatia, and in these countries, it well, the situation is not as good as in, in Hungary itself. I mean, it's not as bad as it's elsewhere. So like Hungary as in Slovakia, or Romania, for instance, they have, a, they have also their own newspapers. They also have, even their own political parties and they are have a strong identity and, uh, and they're also quite doing doing well so to speak but uh, <coughs> but but not as well as in Hungary itself and also in Finnish is also a minority language in Sweden for example and there are also Finnish speakers and also Hungarian speakers in America, for instance, uh, for instance, and 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 um, so about the other languages. Well, in Russia, there are also very different situations. But you can say 
without exaggeration that all the Finno Greek, I mean all the Uralic languages that are spoken in Russia are endangered. But there is a great difference in how endangered they are. Because some are very well if you start from some very small ones like Baltic or Isorian, they are unfortunately going to die out soon because there are so few speakers left. I mean it's still important to support these languages. I'm not saying that but it looks like they are they are well they are very endangered, so to say. And then some languages which are a bit have a bit more speakers like Italian, uh, well they are also endangered. Very few young people are learning these languages anymore. And in well in as I said already, Tundra Nenets, for instance, is doing quite well, but the other Samoyed languages are very endangered. The Obiugric languages are also endangered. I mean not doing very well. There is they are also spoken by I mean, there are people speaking them, which is great. And there are <coughs> some books and uh, newspapers some this kind of stuff published in these languages but but well they are spoken by a very small population and um, well they are <sighs> endangered that there's a lot that could be improved the situation of these languages and the language in central russia central european russia like uh, the central part of european russia like udmurt or mari they have well they have a lot of speakers, and especially Udmurt, they have also a lot of, well, many young speakers. I mean, I'm, I'm not a sort of, uh, I think that many of you or some of you know more about these things than me, but there at least are many young people who are also speaking Udmurt or Mari, but I guess the situation also there varies from whether you are in the city or in the countryside or somewhere, but, uh, but the Udmurt, you know, well, many of you know they have Udmurt discos and so that's kind of things. Uh, That kind of thing. So they are. Uh, they uh, <clears throat> also have the ways to make the their language look cool and um, seems to be a working strategy. But 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 well. So the languages. To sum it up shortly about Russia, the languages. Some of are very endangered. Also the Sami languages in Russia, Kildin Sami, especially Ter Sami. Uh, but some are. Some are doing better. But nowhere is the situation perfect. So everywhere there's lot of improvement needing needed i mean more no i mean of, although there are language laws in many parts of russia practically they are not working usually often so there might be street signs in two languages but there should be what well, there should be there should be kindergartens and uh, language nests and all kinds of these kinds of things but i mean and well there are a number of ways to improve on the situation of these languages and i hope that The situation will improve in the future, and well, about about I mean, it's not it is well endangered, but in some places it's in more endangered. I'm in Norway, it's doing quite strongly. In Sweden and Finland, maybe less strongly, but better than the other Sami languages. In Sami is spoken by maybe 400 speakers, but it's doing strongly because uh, because children are learning it. This, because of language nest, there was once a desperate situation where, where, when almost Working. So I hope you'll hear me now. My internet st stopped working, so 
there probably was a small course. But anyway, so the Sami languages have also differing sociolinguistic situations. And also there is this Mianchieli, which is very close related to Finnish in, in Sweden. And it, well, it's... Uh, I, well, I actually don't know that more that much. I mean, I would like to know more about the social linguistic situation of Mianchieli, but I, if I know correctly, it's also not learned by that many young people as would be desirable. And uh, the Kvein language, which is also very close related to Finnish in Norway, in northern Norway, has the same kind of problems. M maybe more even. Actually, about this Kvein and Mianchieli, well, I have to say that although I mean, they are officially recognized as, uh, as separate languages, which is good. And I sort of agree. Uh, they are very, they are, uh, linguistically speaking, they are very, very close related to Finnish. So that's why earlier some people considered them dialects of Finnish. But these days they are considered by, considered uh, no sound. Okay, but well, well you can hear. Uh, okay, so actually that was pretty much what I had prepared. I mean, it was maybe something about everything. But uh, well, anyway, if you have questions, there is actually a small bibliography, and I will um, check this. I might add some before before sending this to you, or I will send, or Artyom will send. Somehow we will speak about this, but uh, but anyway, this is a bibliography which I hope you can see. So uh, these are some of the articles and books that my presentation was based on. And uh, in some of these, you can find more information on some things that I said. So I have actually no more. I haven't prepared to say more, but if you have if you have questions, you are free to ask them now, and I hope I will be able to answer them. So, so th thank you for your attention. Kiitos huomiosta, bachem tau, and so on. So, if you have questions, you can you can write them here, and I will try to answer them. But uh, oh yes, that's a very good question by. Maria, there are Iranian loanwords in Samoic languages. Um, so yes, there are. There are some. Actually, it's interesting that it seems that almost that there are not very many of them, but there are some. And it seems that most of those most that Samoic languages maybe don't share any of these loanwords with other with finno ugric languages. So that it seems that they were acquired separately by Samoyedic. So there are there are some uh, there is a good article about this by Juha Janhunen was published in 1983 in the in this uh, Symposium Seculare festive volume of Finno Ugric Society. I can add it to the bibliography and uh, in this uh, article by Jako Häkkinen, which is written here, this Häkkinen, 2009, there is something about these loanwords also. So, so there are some in some way. And actually, it maybe it's possible to find more, even. I mean, I would love to find some more. Uh, well, I mean, um, there have been many, a lot of, I mean, although there has been a lot of research also in some way, etymology maybe a bit less than on the etymology of some other Uralic languages, so it would be possible to find some more. Ah, yes, the Nyan, it's an Iranian loanword also, so it came first to Komi and through it to the Hanti and Nenets, yes, and to Komi it came from from some Iranian languages, uh, I, uh, it's probably from some Middle Iranian, so it's not the part of the oldest, oldest Iranian loanwords, but it's definitely a loanword from an Iranian language, and it was first brought to Komi, and from there eastwards to 
of your Greek languages and, and then it's, for instance, Are there any more <clears throat> questions? So, so if there are not, uh, I would like to thank you all. Oh yes, yes, there are. Sorry, Baltic body. Well, yes, that's a good question about. So, well, uh, well, they do. Well, there are some words that seem to be. Borrowed from substrate languages, both to Baltic and to and to to Finnic, to Baltic Finnic. But I mean, these diphthongs uh, are they don't have anything to do with these substrates because um, because because uh, I mean, in in Finnic, this kind of substrate like ia and uo, they are actually derived from the long vowels of proto balto Finnic, and in Estonian. They were retained as long vowels, and in some other Finnic languages, and in Finnic, so it's like a, it was like ke, ki, Finnic, Finnish kieli, which means tongue or language. It's kieli in kiel in Estonian, for instance. So, so these uh, diphthongs are not common substrate. And many of these diphthongs in Baltic, they are um, uh, well, uh, actually, um, if you're interested in this particular Baltic diphthong. This year there is an um, article about that by uh, Lempit Vapa in the, I think it's the newest number of Linguistica Uralica. Uh, but uh, actually this, this particular diphthong is year in Proto-Baltic, it, it was A, so it, which is in year in today's Lithu Lithuanian, it was, if I know correctly, it was A in Proto-Baltic, so it's actually also a later development in Lithuanian also. But I would say that uh, there might be some substrate words in which are common in Baltic and in Finnic, but uh, I would say that these diphthongs, at least according to my knowledge, they are not caused by any substrate influence. And also, of course, there were diphthongs already in... Well... Uh, well, yes, diphthongs already in proto uralic and proto Indo European. So, so the fact that Baltic and Finnic have them, it's another. It's another. Well, it's only logical from this point of view. It, it seems that this. Uh, if you write something to chat, there is a small uh, delay before I see it. So, I'm going to wait for a while. If so. Do I agree with Häkkinen? Uh, well, I guess you mean Jakko Häkkinen now, because there are Kaisa Häkkinen and Jakko Häkkinen who are unrelated, but they have worked on similar, similar issues, but not on exactly the same issues. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, um, well, I, I don't completely agree with him, but I found some of his views very good and some of the arguments he used very. Well, so I would say that he's maybe. Most famous idea that uh, the Ugric and Samoidic languages could be close related to each other. Well, there might be a grain of root, grain of root in that idea. At least uh, it's uh, difficult to explain some of those similarities. Otherwise, but maybe not all of them. So I, I would say that I don't. Well, I don't completely agree with, agree with Hackinen on everything, but I. Uh, support some of his views and I think that his everything he has written is definitely worth uh, to be taken into account if, if, if for people like me who are doing historical Uralic linguistics. Well, what languages do I speak? Well, uh, I speak Finnish, it's my native language, uh, English, which I hope has been understandable for the most part of the evening, and then I speak Hungarian, so I this Three, I would say that I speak quite well, and then I speak Swedish, but not as well as English or Hungarian. 
I mean, I like enjoy speaking it, and it's uh, would like to speak it better, but I don't speak it perfectly, but can communicate. And then, well, my speak Russian to some extent, but not to the extent that I could have this kind of presentation in Russian here. And then, well, I know some Karelian, or Karelian quite well, and then some Estonian, not as well as I would like to, but maybe I would like, well, maybe I will, well, it's my aim to learn more about that, but I can also communicate on basic things on Estonian. And uh, well, there and, and there are many Uralic languages which I know to some extent, like North Sami and Vepsian and Mari and so on. So I can speak them fluently, but uh, can say something and have theoretical knowledge on them. And, and for, I mean, for most Uralic languages, I have some kind of theoretical, I mean, well, not of all of them, but for most, uh, most of them, I have some kind of theoretical knowledge of how they work, but I can't speak most of them, unfortunately. I mean, I would love to speak Mansi. I have studied Mansi on some occasions, but uh, once once I had a native teacher, but only for a couple of months, I didn't really learn to speak it. But I would love to learn to speak it. For instance, so and well and well and there are well, I have studied Greek and Latin and so on, but I obviously can't speak them as I mean classical Greek and Latin as very few people actually speak them these days and. Uh, same for Sanskrit and Avesta and an old person, so I... Well, maybe that's enough for a list of languages. Maybe German and French could be mentioned because then I actually can speak to some extent, although they are both a bit rusty. So as... Uh, so if, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to thank Artyom and the Mafun for organizing this Mafun Academy and giving me a possibility to speak about speak about this topic. So I will do some. I will correct some of the misprints in my uh, presentation, and then I will give it to Artyom. And uh, or, 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 or in a way or one way or another, we will be able to send it to you. So thank you all for your interest, and thank you for your interesting questions and comments. And have a good night and uh, hope to see you soon. So, thank you.